Did you know that when the two halves of a person's brain are surgically disconnected, you can still communicate with the two halves individually because each eye connects to a separate half. So if you have the patient who's had this surgery cover one of their eyes, and then with the other eye, you have them read a sheet of paper, and on that sheet of paper, it asks them to stand up and do the chicken dance. And then while they're doing that, if you actually cover the other eye, show them a sheet of paper that has the question written on it, why are you dancing like this right now? The patient's brain will not be confused and not understand why they're dancing. The part of the brain that doesn't really know why it's doing the dance will actually confabulate an answer. So think about that for a minute. Instead of that part of the brain actually not understanding why it's doing the chicken dance and acknowledging such, it just decides to make up an answer. That's confabulating. So the subject might say something along the lines of, oh, I wanted to lighten the mood, so I decided the chicken dance would be a funny way to do it, even though that's not actually why they did it. It's just the reason why they did it is still contained in the other half of the brain. It just starts to make you wonder, are any of the decisions that we make in life actually real decisions, or were they somewhat confabulated after the fact, after some other decision maker deeper inside of our brain had already started having us do something. Like, just let that sink in. There's a bunch of examples of this, but with split brain patients, when the different eyes, which are connected to different hemispheres of the brain, make a decision and tell you why they made it, they're not doing it as a joke. They're not doing it with the awareness that they're missing information. They're just confabulating, but it's true to them. Now, my guess would be that for normal people whose brains connected correctly and the eyes are able to connect to the different sides of the brain but also cross communicate with what they're seeing, something very similar is happening and there's a good chance that most of the decisions we make, the most of the personality that we are could be confabulated. And I know that's a crazy world where us and every human that we interact with is simply just making it up as we go along. They're just stories that are created after the fact and what that means for artificial intelligence is something I want to get into in this video. Okay, so to start things off, I want to talk to you about a researcher named Roger Sperry and some of his groundbreaking experiments in split brain patients. So spanning from 1959 up until 1968, his work marked a significant milestone in the way that we understand how the human brain works. And that gave us some profound insight into how the two hemispheres of the brain operate both independently and collaboratively. And this work marked a significant milestone in the understanding of the human brain. It gave us some profound insight into how the two hemispheres actually can think and work independently, but they work collaboratively at the end of the day. And this revolutionized the world of neuroscience and made both scientists and regular people start to ask, what the heck is going on up there? Now, before diving into Sperry's experiments, it's essential to understand the context and the world that we were in in 1960 when these things were being done, because ethically, they probably wouldn't happen today, but also at that time, making some of these surgical connection cuts made sense in certain people for specific reasons. In the late 1950s, the medical community was grappling with a few serious types of epilepsy. And it was thought without the two hemispheres being able to connect, these patients wouldn't suffer so badly from epileptic seizures. So this was done to a handful of patients and the first real experiment that really blew people's mind was when one of these split brain patients was actually shown two separate images. So one to each hemisphere by closing the eye and only showing them words through the eye. So interestingly, the way the eyes are wired is they cross over, but they only connect to one hemisphere. So your left eye is actually only connected to your right hemisphere and vice versa. So by covering one eye and having some read something with only that eye, that information or that image only makes it to one hemisphere of the brain. And one of the big breakthroughs, the thing that like completely changed neuroscience at the time is if you close the left eye and you show an image to the right eye, that means the left hemisphere can see it. That's the only eye that you can verbally describe what you're seeing from. So if you cover the right eye, show an image to the left eye, there is no way that you can describe that. For some reason, language isn't connected to that hemisphere. Hence, that's why they say language is in our left brain. So we have evidence that the left hemisphere is the only place where verbal communication is controlled, not language altogether, but actually verbally being able to speak about something that you see, that can only take place with the right eye, left hemisphere, when you have a split brain patient. But of course, the other half of the brain has a bunch of skills too. So if you cover the right eye, show the image to the left eye, which means the right hemisphere is actually processing it. Although you can't verbally explain what you're seeing, 
you can draw it, which is not possible in the other hemisphere, which is just so mind blowing. That means when you look at an image and you can verbally describe it or draw it, it's because the different hemispheres are doing that separately and then communicating with each other seamlessly. So it feels like you're just answering those questions, verbally describing those images, drawing those images at free will. Now building on Sperry's work, there was some follow up research by another researcher named Michael Gazaniga. And this led to what's known as the interpreter, which lives in the left hemisphere. But the interpreter was a larger explanation for what was going on there. And it was saying that this interpreter part of the brain is actually able to construct full narratives, explanations, rationalizations, take actions based on narratives, have feelings based on narratives. But that all this narration, all this kind of us that's in the left hemisphere was coming from decisions and actions and information that was actually initiated on the right hemisphere. So there's a bunch of different experiments that led to this conclusion, but they often had a format. They would often involve showing different images to each hemisphere, then asking the patient to explain what they saw or to perform the tasks based on visual information. So similar to Sperry's other work, but just much more thorough, and it kind of came up with this idea that, well, over here, we're taking action. Over here, we're narrating what it is. And when you think about yourself, your sort of subconscious, your conscious thoughts, a lot of that self-talk is what we think of ourselves as. That's the interpreter. In a sense, maybe that's the self. Now, over the years, when a lot of different experiments were done in all sorts of different patients, as we learned more about how the brain worked, we came to this common understanding that the left hemisphere is more analytical, it's more logical, it's more language oriented, where the right hemisphere kind of excels at spatial or intuitive or creative tasks. So the common like, are you left brain or right brain kind of person? It basically means, are you more logical and nerdy or are you more like creative and expressive? Now, of course, the brain hemispheres are like the same size, so that's totally a misnomer, but it's just a way to describe personalities more than anything else that kind of is based a little bit on some of this work. But at the crux of all this research is a super fascinating fact that Unlike any other organ in our body, it, that if it was cut in half, it would stop working, it would break. The brain does seem to be able to kind of, in a sense, exist in two different compartments. But it's incredible the two brains actually can be independent in some sense. They can process information, they can turn that into an action that the body takes, like drawing or speaking verbally. And of course, together they work in harmony and they complement each other, but the fact that they even work independently, which is not something you would see in a lot of other organs in your body. If you cut them in half, they would just break and stop working. The brain seems special and it's, we would probably call it like parallelization or the way it could like parallel process. The fact that it can come to conclusions without having the full network involved, meaning you can kind of divide it and conquer. And because it seems like the brain is where one of the most special things about being human actually emerges from consciousness, it kind of starts to open up that question. Like, do you have two conscious people when you cut it in half? Or have you lost that ability? Or were you conscious in the same way? It's just divided? I don't know. And I feel like that's a good place where we can now start to bring artificial intelligence into the conversation. So now let's talk about why Roger Sperry's original split brain experiments matter for understanding how artificial intelligence works. So even though these experiments were done on human brains, there's so many similarities to the way that neural networks were modeled after human neurons and the way the systems just generally achieve what they do, that we can get some valuable insights from that information to apply to the world of AI. Now, the first thing is the dualistic nature nature of the brain has some analogies to the way we're building AI safety systems today. For example, the company called Anthropic, which is building one of these cutting edge models about artificial intelligence, actually uses a similar system to this at its core. It's called the constitutional method. And in a sense, it's a lot like the two hemispheres in the brain. There is one overarching system, a large language model similar to ChatGPT that's just learning from the internet and it's trying to put things out into the world based on the questions that are asked of it. But it's deeply connected to a second system. And that second system is not just about answering questions. It's not about general knowledge. It's about alignment. It's about AI safety. It's about what is it that makes a system safe when it gets smarter than anything else on earth to align it with human needs. So you can almost imagine the left hemisphere of the brain saying, make safe, smart decisions, keep us safe, work in harmony with the humans around you. And then the right side saying, I'm gonna get as smart as I can and I'm gonna achieve all these things and I'm gonna solve all these problems. And there's also a deep connection to the way that parallel processing in GPUs for artificial intelligence mimics some of the way that the brain can actually parallel process. So a parallel process means that you have a 
goal, some big thing that you're trying to process. And the first thing you do, instead of trying to start solving it like a complicated maze, is you break it up into millions of tiny little mazes. You have a bunch of little systems go solve those mazes. You take all those answers, put them back together and get your conclusion. So big artificial intelligence systems like Gemini and ChatGPT use warehouses full of GPUs that are all working in parallel to make these systems learn and act. So you're not really asking a question from a single system. You're asking a question from this massively parallel system. And it seems like in some sense, when you ask a question of a person, you're not getting a single answer. You're actually getting a brain that's processing all sorts of little things at the same time and putting that conclusion together so rapidly, it feels like it's just one question and one answer. But it's clear from Roger Sperry's experiments that it's not just like that. In fact, it could be half the brain. And then what you do is come up with an answer, which is sort of confabulated, and then you feel, as the person saying it, as if that was the decision, the reason why you did it in the first place. And that weird, like, jumping back in history and pretending that you made it as a decision is something I'll talk about at the end of this video. But for now, I just want to point out that the brain does mirror some of the architecture that we see in parallel processing systems in large AI systems now. And from this thought process, it does make sense that we might think about different AI agents out on the internet. So something like GPTs, those like custom modules that you can get from ChatGPT now, but all over the internet, all communicating with one another to solve different problems because of different people's competing needs, more like a marketplace of different AI systems all processing in parallel, but because they're communicating with one another, in a sense, they might end up sort of like a human brain with all these little components that kind of add up to something that is more than the sum of their parts. Different subsystems, different algorithms, they all have inputs and outputs, and those outputs become inputs for other systems, and there's just this mesh net of information that's being processed in parallel, but also in systems and subsystems, and they can all come together. In the same way that half our hemisphere can verbally communicate, the other can actually draw, but the two together make a much more complete person. So knowing this, I can't help but personally have that thought about what is actually going on inside of my brain, especially when I'm not talking out loud, but I'm talking to myself in my own head. Much of my day is spent in my own head what, what do you need to do next, Dylan? And then kind of answering that, are you hungry? Where should we eat? Should we spend time at the gym or should we try to get some more work done? Should we do A or B or C? There's this constant debate, but I'm the person coming up with the questions and I'm the person answering them. And what are what am I doing? Like are those subsystems that are coming up with conclusions and then other systems that take that information and analyze it? Or is it something about the two hemispheres connected to each other sort of processing information back and forth? Or is all of that just big communication at the highest level where the whole brain comes up with a question, the whole brain comes up with an answer, and subsystems are just playing a role in guiding how those questions and answers come to the forefront? I don't know. Now imagine translating that into robots of the future, especially in the realm of self-learning systems, autonomous decision-making, self-driving cars, robots that help us around the house. Are they gonna find their own source of consciousness through confabulation, through parallel processing and then unification at the end? Are we going to be able to understand at a higher level what the subsystems are, the ones that could actually cause problems, how risky they are for a machine to potentially do something that's unexpected or unwanted? Another question it kind of raises, which I know is starting to get out there a little bit, but if all humans are thought of as components or agents that are processing information essentially in parallel, because as we're all awake and we're all processing information, we're processing different parts of the larger environment, the bigger system, is it possible that there is a tendency for the entire system, meaning the output from all humans, maybe all biological life, all animals, all information processing systems in a big ecosystem like the planet to have an overall intention, basically a worldwide consciousness? Kind of. There sort of is if you think about it in those terms. But I also acknowledge that it could just be chaos. Like they could be processing information individually and it never adds up to anything that's more special than the sum of its parts. Maybe it is just the parts doing what they do. But it's an interesting question to think about. It's interesting to think about self-awareness or independent decision-making and it echoes the independent yet interconnected functionalities of our split brain. So let me know which half of the brain you are by either pressing the left or the right half of that subscribe button. Help me get to my next goal, 9,000 subscribers. Thanks for watching.